All right, so one of the important things about a DBQ is not misinterpreting the documents. Uh, and the better we can interpret them, the better chance we stand of being able to group them together and make sure we're using the correct evidence to support our claims. So I'm going to go through real quick here the different documents as just kind of an extra little bit of help to see um, that you don't misinterpret them. So um, the process is, so here's our first document, the process I always like to go through is to look at first who is saying this, what they do. So here we have Johann Verti, um, obviously a man. He's describing the German astronomer Marie Kunitz. So he's talking about a woman um, and she wrote this. <clears throat> um, so when you look at what he has to say, you know, she was so deeply engaged in astronomical speculation that she neglected her household. Maybe he's taking a shot at her a little bit, right? That uh, he's not so happy that she was so engaged in astronomical speculation that here she is neglecting, and he uses this word choice, neglected, neglecting her household, which at the time, if you remember, was um, kind of what the woman's role was, right? To take care of the household and the kids and those kinds of things. And here he is saying she's neglecting that because she's doing the science stuff. And then he goes on to kind of explain the daylight hour she spent, for the most part, in bed because she had tired herself from watching the stars at night. So you might conclude from this, knowing that it's a guy, he's a German astronomer, he's talking about a woman, um, that he is probably not excited about her being in the sciences because she is neglecting her traditional role as a woman in society at the time of being someone who's in charge of the house and the kids and should not be participating in the sciences. So maybe this guy has a bit of a negative view or attitude towards that. We go down to document two. Once again, here's Marie Mierdrak. So all of a sudden now I have a woman. She's a French scientist and this is from the foreword, which is kind of a little introduction into her book. She wrote a book called Chemistry Simplified for Women. So she's writing a book to make chemistry a little bit more accessible to women of the time who maybe don't have as much education and training <clears throat> and she goes on to kind of talk that when she began this little treatise or endeavor uh, it was solely for her own satisfaction I objected to myself that it was not the profession of a lady to teach that she should remain silent listen and learn without displaying her own knowledge so she's kind of saying she initially objects to herself for doing this, like, God, maybe I shouldn't do this. The traditional role of a woman is to, is to teach. She should, remain, you know, she should remain silent, listen and learn without displaying her knowledge. She shouldn't teach uh, people how to do things, right? That's not her role in society. And then she goes on to say, but on the other hand, I flattered myself that I'm not the first lady to have had something published right that there's other women that have come before her and done some of these things and that minds you know your brain and your ability to think and reason and all that don't have a sex so we're just as equal to men and that if women's minds were allowed to be cultivated and educated and nurtured and those kinds of things just like we do for men in society that we would be just as equal right so we want to make sure that here's a woman basically saying <clears throat> she's given us some insight into what the times were right that women weren't supposed to do these things women were supposed to do these things right here but um, at the same time she's saying but you know what I'm, I'm not the first one to do this and you know what I think I think we are just as capable and so she's kind of her attitude is we're just as good and 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 we should be you know she has a positive attitude towards women being in the sciences. <clears throat> Document three, you've got Samuel Pepys, once again another guy, here he is, and he's talking about after dinner I walked to a meeting of the Royal Society of Science, so he goes off to the scientific meeting in expectation of hearing the Duchess of Newcastle, um, who's a woman obviously, so he's going to hear a woman speaker who had desired to be invited to the society. So this woman is trying to get into the Royal Society of Scientists. So he goes to go hear her speak. She was invited after much debate, pro and con. So there was a lot of discussion whether or not she should even be invited. 
uh, and it seems many being against them. So there's a lot of resistance to her being in the sciences, probably by men. The Duchess hath been a good, comely woman, meaning she was attractive enough and all that, but her dress was so antique and her deportment so ordinary that I do not like her at all, nor did I hear her say anything that was worth hearing. So the first thing he comments on is how she is dressed and what she looks like. And he's basically saying that eh, she wasn't all that attractive, she didn't wear great clothing, she just conducted herself like a normal person. I wasn't interested a whole lot in her. And then eh, as a second thought, I didn't really hear anything that you know she had to say. So here's a guy who probably is not very excited about having a woman in the sciences, right? And then he judges her based on her looks, and he's, based on that, he's not excited about it. Here we have an actual piece of art. You're not going to obviously get any quotes from this, but based on what this piece of artwork kind of is, it says it's Johans and Elisabetha Havelius using a sextant. That's this piece of uh, measuring tool here. Uh, doing some astronaut, you know, they're collaborating on astronomical research. Um, and so it came from the book you know, by Johann Hevelius. So the, the man wrote this book, The Heavenly Machine, and he included this photo or image in there of he and his wife collaborating. And so uh, here they are collaborating on this. And so based on the fact that they're working together, they're husband and wife, he uses the word collaborating. Um, you could probably pull from this uh, that this man was, you know, kind of had a positive outlook towards women or positive attitude towards women working in the sciences. Here he clearly is. He's, he includes that in the book, uh, gives her credit, um, and he's okay with that. So... Here's an instance where a man is, is positive or has a positive attitude towards women in the sciences. Document five, Maria Sibylla Marion. She's a German entomologist, right, and wrote this book. So here she is. Since my youth, I have studied insects when I realized that butterflies and moths were more develop more quickly than other caterpillars. I collected all the caterpillars that I could find in order to observe their metamorphosis. Thus, I withdrew from human society and engaged exclusively in these investigations. In addition, I learned the art of drawing so that I could draw and describe them as they were in nature. So instead of doing her normal thing as a woman, she decided to withdraw from that and spend all of her time drawing and doing these investigations into um, what caterpillars and what they do and the metamorphosis that goes along with that. And, uh, and really writing a book that really kind of forwarded the sciences on that. So if you have to make a determination of what her attitude or reaction was, um, you would have to say, well, she obviously dove into this and probably had a pretty positive um, attitude towards women being in the sciences because she clearly dedicated her whole life to that. Document six. Gottfried Kirch, German astronomer, husband of Maria Winkelmann. Okay, so maybe that plays into it in some way. But we have a man here. Early in the morning, about 2 a.m., the sky was clear and starry. Some nights before, I had observed a variable star, and my wife, as I slept, wanted to find and see it for herself. In so doing, she found a comet in the sky, at which time she woke me, and I found that it was indeed a comet. I was surprised that I had not seen it the night before. So... You might originally think that, well, maybe this guy has a pretty positive attitude. Here he is. He's married to um, Maria Winkleman, whoever she might be. And she finds this comment, and he seems to be stating that, hey, he might have, you know, he was surprised that he hadn't seen it the night before. So you could interpret it. Maybe he's got a positive attitude. But maybe what he really has is more of a, an astonished attitude, more surprised that he being a man had not seen it the night before. How could a woman, his wife, uh, have seen this and discovered this when he clearly is superior to her in terms of the sciences and intellect? So he might also be a guy who 
is a little bit more surprised that women are capable of doing some of these things that men aren't because he was surprised that he hadn't seen it before. How could he have missed it if she clearly could have seen it? Document seven, God freed Leibniz, another man. So here we go. I've often thought that women of elevated mind, women of smart, educated mind, advanced knowledge more properly than do men. Women whose position puts them above troublesome and laborious cares are more detached and therefore more capable of contemplating the good and the beautiful. So he's kind of saying, hey, women who are of pretty smart stature, maybe have some, some decent education, tend to, uh, tend to do some things that are a little bit better than men. He sees that women are pretty smart. So maybe he's a man who is taking a positive attitude towards women being educated in the sciences or just having an education in general. And so maybe that's what's going on here. Document eight, <clears throat> I do not believe that Maria Winkleman, okay, so here's that woman again. Uh, now here's Johann Theodor Jablonski. He's the secretary to the Berlin Academy of Sciences. So here's the Berlin, the German Academy of the Sciences. He's kind of a ranking member in that. Um, he sends a letter to the Academy president who's opposing Maria Winkleman's application for membership. So Maria wants to get into this academy. This guy is sending a letter opposing it um, and said she should continue to work on our official calendar of observations. Um, he doesn't believe she should do that. It will simply not do even before her husband's death. The Academy was ridiculed because its calendar was prepared by women. If she were to be kept on in such a capacity, mouths would gape even wider. So he's basically saying that he doesn't believe that she should be allowed into the society or the Academy because already people were talking. It was bringing press. Um, you know, the, the media was being covered in the media. Um, it was bringing them maybe some scandal, people were being critical of their academy. He doesn't like that, he's trying to protect the academy and he doesn't want um, them to have any more you know, publicity that might be negative. People who don't want think women should be doing this and here's the academy allowing her. So he's saying, don't allow her in. I don't think this should be good, this would be good for our academy. Document nine, some will feel as if I declare war on men by practicing medicine. Okay, so Dorothea Exlobin, first woman to be granted a German doctor's degree, right? So here she is, and this is what she has to say. Some will feel that I declare war on men, or at least attempt to deprive them of their privilege. So she's making a statement of, of what society generally believes, that, that men are the privileged class, and they're the ones that should have those good jobs and that by her wanting to become a doctor or practicing medicine, that she is attacking that and attacking men. Many of my own sex will think I place myself above them. And she's saying many other women will think that, that uh, Dorothea just believes she's better than all the other women out there. And so she's really making a statement of what a lot of people in society believe um, about women participating in the sciences. Okay, so that's really what she's saying. Document 10, Johann Junker, head of the university, right? Learned women attract little attention as long as they limit their study to music and the arts. When a woman dares to attend a university, however, or qualifies for and receives a doctorate, which is the high, you know, your PhD degree, your, you know, your third level degree at the university, she attracts a great deal of attention. The legality of such an undertaking must be investigated. So he's kind of saying that if they just stick to music and the arts, and which are kind of you know viewed as areas that women are allowed to kind of partake in, then they don't get a whole lot of attention. But when she dares to qualify for or receive a doctorate, a higher level degree, most likely in the sciences, then she gets a lot of attention. We don't really like this attention and we should look at the legality of her being allowed to do this and maybe overturn a woman's ability to go get these higher degrees because we don't want that kind of negative attention from society Then we need to rethink what we're doing here. Document 11, 
the Marquis Emily du Chatelet, and she's sending a letter to this guy, Marquis Jean Francois de Saint Lambert. Okay, so do not reproach me for my work on translating Newton's Principia. Never have I made a greater sacrifice to reason. I get up at nine, sometimes at eight. I work till three, then I take coffee. I resume work for at four. I, so she's talking about how much work and effort she puts in uh, to do the translation of Newton's work. And then, uh, <clears throat> you know, she's talking about some of these other big names that come and visit her. Uh, and then she goes back to work. I do this or I lose the fruit of my labors if I should die in childbirth. So here she is, this guy, French aristocrat, uh, I'm sorry, Marquis Jean Francois has apparently been very critical of her doing these kinds of things. And she's basically calling him out and saying, look how hard I work. I do all of this so that way I don't lose my child and I can make sure uh, that my work isn't gone uh, when I, if, I, if I do die in childbirth but I don't lose everything, so I'm working unbelievably hard. Don't you dare talk to me about being a woman and being lazy or anything else or neglecting my duties. Look how hard I'm working. So she's kind of making a statement about what people in general, men in general felt about women working in the sciences, that they shouldn't be doing that. And then she's kind of calling the guy out and saying, this is baloney. Uh, I'm working really hard to do all of this and live up to my womanly duties. Document 12, Marie Thoreau de Arkinville, another woman. Women should not study medicine and astronomy. These subjects fall beyond their sphere of competence. Women should be satisfied with the power that their grace and beauty give them and not extend their empire to include medicine and astronomy. Now it sounds like she's saying, hey, I'm a woman and I don't think women should do these things. And they should just be happy to be pretty. Um, but, when you read it in a different way, because you think about that she's actually written this book, um, she's also an anatomical illustrator, that she's probably being sarcastic here. And she's probably saying, clearly women should just be happy with being graceful and, ha and be okay with the beauty that's been given to them. The subjects of medicine and astronomy clearly are beyond their ability to understand she kind of says that here, but here she is, a woman, right, who has written a book, Thoughts on Literature, Morals, and Physics. She's an anatomical illustrator. She clearly is an expert in these areas, and she's basically being sarcastic, right? And she's, she's having a sarcastic tone here to say that, oh, clearly we can't do this, but yet I just did it, right? So... Don't misinterpret this one. She's a woman that's in favor of it, but she's being sarcastic. So make note of that. And then finally, document 13. Usually one thinks of a learned woman as neurotic. So we have a newspaper article who's describing this woman, right? The first woman to receive a very high level degree from a German university. And this is what they write about. Usually one thinks of a learned woman as neurotic, a little crazy, and she never and she should. And should she ever go beyond the study of literature into higher sciences, one knows in advance that her clothing will be neglected and her hair will be done in antiquarian fashion. This is the general belief that people have in society. I think they're kind of making that statement there. She forces her way into circles of men for whom she is nothing more than a book, right? For Mademoiselle Schlosser, this is not at all the case. She sews, knits, and understands household economy perfectly well. One must gain her confidence before one comes to know the scholar in her. So they're basically saying all these things that you used to think about women are not true. She does all of those things that traditionally women are supposed to do. And on top of it, she's an unbelievably well-educated woman, has received a PhD, and is a true scholar. So maybe this newspaper is kind of taking a different attitude of maybe it is okay. And most likely, this newspaper was probably written by a man. So that gives you some insight into what some of these documents mean. Make sure you don't misinterpret those. So when you go to get your groupings and you go to use your evidence to back up your statements 
in your DBQ, uh, make sure you're using appropriate ones.